So we uh, started a series last weekend uh, on relating to the psychedelic artwork behind me. Uh, if you can't read, it says all you need is love. And uh, you, hey, you might be interested. Uh, somebody from our church family suggested we take that graphic, put it on some yard signs and make those available for people. Just kind of a good news, feel good message for our community. So we did that. We printed a hundred of them. And if you want one of those, just come by our church office Monday through Thursday. Uh, donation of 10 bucks will cover the cost of those. We'd love to put them up throughout our community. And if a hundred isn't enough, we'll get some more. But if you're interested in that, I would love to let you know about that. So uh, it would seem to me that for some of us, uh, a 60s theme song, All You Need Is Love, might seem a little bit trite uh, or maybe too lightweight. Or some of you kind of grew up in the 60s and you know all that went with that. And so uh, you barely remember the 60s. But th the truth of the matter is that that name of that song, All You Need Is Love, is actually theologically dead on. And it's part of what we've been talking together since last weekend, and we will the weeks ahead, from a passage that uh, Paul writes, not Paul McCartney, but Paul the Apostle writes, where he is uh, possibly the, the, the most famous words on the subject of love that anybody's ever written, maybe for sure in the Bible. But we've been looking at that from 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, it's interesting how Paul introduces the subject, like, three quarters at least of the way through the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, now, I want to I wanna show you, I want to tell you about the most excellent kind of life, the best life, the best life you could possibly live. Well, if you hear that, it kind of makes you sit up a little bit and you wonder, well, what's he going to say? What, what's, how's he going to describe that, right? Well, this is what he does. He uh, doesn't kind of describe it right away. He takes this sidetrack, what it looks like. In the end, it turns around that he's actually taken us someplace. But he says, you know, if, if there ever was someone that could speak all the languages of earth, all 7,000 of them, plus the languages of heaven, the linguistics of heaven, and if let's say that same person had all knowledge, knew everything about everything, was a subject matter of, of every subject that there was, and on top of that, had the ability to move mountains just by believing and speaking into it that the mountains would move. But that person doesn't have love. They would amount to what Paul would say, that they amount to nothing. It, they, their lives aren't m meaningful. And you go, well, whoa, just a second. That's pretty a profound ability to do that. But here's what he's saying. He's saying that love trumps all. And so in a way, he's saying everything minus love is nothing or you could actually say it this way love is absolutely everything and you could start with nothing but if you've got it you've got everything and so it's uh, like paul presents this to us and he wants to describe what it is and uh, though in our culture we might see it we might read it a little different we might not talk about somebody that can speak all seven thousand languages we might say it this way if you have more facebook Instagram and Twitter followers than anybody else combined, but you don't have love, you're not following God. We might say it this way. If you're a YouTube superstar, hundreds of millions of followers that check in on your channel all the time, but you don't have love, you're just an empty talking head. Another way that we might say it is if you have a BA from Yale and you have an MBA from Harvard and a doctorate from Cambridge, but you don't have love, you've got some embossed paper and kind of ornate frames hanging on your wall. That's what you have. We could say it this way. If you create a startup worth a billion dollars and you're on the cover of Forbes magazine and you're in the Fortune 50 Hall of Fame and you don't have love, you're keeping score of stuff that God doesn't keep score of. Or we might even say if you could outcatch Larry Fitzgerald or outsing Taylor Swift or out Amazon Jeff Bezos, or out Tesla, Elon Musk, and you don't have love, it really doesn't amount to a whole lot. But we think it might, but it doesn't. So the best life that Paul can possibly think of, and the one that counts for everything, is the life of someone who is thoroughly through and through saturated as a loving person. Now, that passage is uh, recorded in a letter that's written to a group of Christians in the first century to a city in Rome. It's one of the leading cities of Rome. And by the time we get to the end of those three short verses where Paul talks about everything minus love is nothing, 
it's almost like he says, I think I might have kind of stunned you or lost you along the way. I need to describe for you. I need to define for you what I'm talking about that kind of love would be. And this is what he says in the next four verses in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, starting, he says, so here it is. Love is patient. It's kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Now, my guess is this is not the first time you've heard that passage of Scripture read. My guess would be if you've been to a wedding or two, it's been read at a wedding, and it's got this flowery, romantic feel to it wasn't written around that romantic feel to it. Uh, wasn't, Paul did not write this with weddings in mind. It, also, it might surprise you to know that Paul is not describing what our behavioral goal in life might be. Like he isn't saying, it would be really good if you were patient, or at least more patient. I really recommend to you that you like, don't stop keeping record of wrongs, that people wrong you, stop doing that. Like, be humble. That would be a good thing to achieve and be more. Now, those are all good. But that's not what he's after. He's not giving us a new behavioral standard. Now, this is really important. If we miss that, we will miss the whole passage and the whole intent of this series if we miss how he introduces that list of terms. Two short words that are packed full of deep meaning. So back to verse 4. This is how he starts this list. He says, love is love is this is kind of back to basics it's uh not just another to-do list it's at the essence of what it means to be a follower of jesus you see here's the thing when he listed out that unique person at the front end of this chapter do you know who he's describing he's actually describing god because it's god that speaks all the languages of humans and god speaks the language of heaven and god's a subject matter expert he knows everything about everything there's nothing that's known that he does not know. You know, stuff we don't know. And more than that, he's the guy that can just speak mountains into existence. Apparently he can speak to a pile of dirt and make a mountain out of it. So he's talking about God, but here's the thing. All those amazing things that God does, what makes them amazing is not that they're amazing in themselves. They all pale as amazing as they are in light of his amazing love for people. I think this is what Paul's trying to get across. And he just starts to list that if you are love like God is love, this is what it looks like. This is what comes out of someone who is love. Isn't just loving, but is love. So God does not just love. He does, but he loves because of who he is. It's not an attribute. It's simply who he is. So you could say, and it must have been so encouraging to hear, and I hope it is for you today as well, that this is our God who is love. He is patient. God is kind. God isn't jealous. He isn't boastful. He's not proud ever. He's never rude. God does not demand his own way. Isn't that something? He's not irritable. I'm glad he's not. God keeps no record of wrongs. He doesn't, doesn't ever rejoice with injustice but he rejoices when truth wins out. God never gives up, God never loses faith, God's always hopeful, God endures in every circumstance, that's our God. But it's not because he's loving, it's because he is love. He can't stop doing that. What, why would that matter so much? I think of somebody that came to visit me some time ago, and they were in a really bad spot, a lot of just tough stuff going on in their world and their life. And we sat down to talk and uh, she said, you know, I, I don't think God loves me anymore. And I went, oh man, like that's way too heavy a burden to, to carry. Like, like, do, you, do you think God exists? Oh yeah, no question. I know God exists. This world couldn't be what it is, but I know that he exists. Well, then it's not possible for him to not love you because he doesn't look at you and decide to love you. He is love and can't help himself from loving you. This is so different from us, but this is who he wants us to become. And this is why this matters so much. Because this list is not a list of attributes that you and I should shoot for, that we should try to attain. Rather, God wants to make us the kind of person who just has these oozing out of us. They're just the effects of who we are because we have his personal presence in us. And when we have his personal presence in us, 
We have love inside of us. And when you see it, you can't miss it. When you run into somebody that has love in them, you'll catch yourself saying things like, what's with her? Like, she is so patient. She never used to be as patient as that. But like, what's got into her? Or he always tells the truth. He used to kind of fib and, you know, spin the truth, try to make himself look good. But he seems to love the truth now. When she couldn't forgive, like ever forgive, somehow she has found something inside of her, some inner strength that she keeps no record of wrongs. She's not jealous. He's not jealous. You know, he used to make fun of people that were like physically different than him in some way. And the oddest things going on, there must be something inside of him because he now defends the very people he would have made fun of. When you see somebody like that and you run into them, you admire that. In fact, it's not uncommon when we see someone like that to say, well, that's so amazing, that's wonderful. I wonder if I'm like that. I wonder if I'm changing. You know, I call myself a Christian, but I don't honestly know that if I'm any more humble, any kinder, more patient, forgiving, less irritable or rude, I don't know if I'm any more tolerant or understanding than I was a few years ago. I don't know if I am. I think I'm about as angry and critical and I hold grudges and I gossip about the same as I ever did. And I just keep thinking someone else is the problem and why I'm that, but I wonder how I could ever become that kind of person. Well, one of Jesus' 12 guys was confronted with this question, or at least if he wasn't confronted with the question, he gives us the answer toward the end of his life, what the answer to the question is, how you can become that kind of person. In what appears to be his kind of final statement, maybe he's writing out his memoirs, maybe dictating, he's telling about his experiences with Jesus and how he discovered Jesus to be who he was. And it's like he just admits the thing, like it's, It's tough for us humans, we struggle, even as Jesus followers, to love and to grow in love. We aspire to it, but it's hard for us. And uh, so he writes this, but I gotta tell you, it should come with a warning label. It's, It's unvarnished, it's unfiltered, it's gritty, and it should have a warning label. This is what he writes, this is John in 1 John 4, 8, he says, but anyone who does not love, hold on, does not know God, for God is love. So if you write a hateful email, if you can't forgive someone, if you can't respect someone for how they look or the uniform they wear, if you gossip or you lie or pride trips you up, it's because you don't know God. Now, hold on just a second. You might be about ready to turn the TV off when you hear that because that's a bit discouraging, but I've got really good news for you. It can be fixed and you're going to love the fix. You're going to love it because it's what you long for. It's what I long for. And when we fully embrace the answer to this, we will find ourselves in naturally becoming loving people. John seems to suggest the problem is we don't know God, right? Well, To know God is not really anything like knowing about God or believing that God is real. Scriptures actually tell us that residents of the darker part of the spiritual world, they know that he exists and they shudder. They're afraid, but they're fully aware that he exists. It's not the same thing. To know God in this context that John is speaking about means to have a growing, close, personal, interactive friendship of love with God. A daily sense that God and I are doing all of life together, giving, receiving, sharing love with each other. Knowing God is not thinking of him as a distant deity someplace out there that we call on when we need him, when things go bad for us. We can do that, but that's not what he's talking about. Knowing God is not living a moral enough life to meet the minimum behavioral threshold to make sure we get to heaven. It's not what knowing God is. Knowing God is not practicing religious ceremony or duty to earn enough favor points to make sure we have God's blessing rather than his disappointment. No. Knowing God has been reduced over the last decades to upholding a particular standard of ethical values, interestingly derived from knowing God personally, but gradually dispersing and dispensing with the idea and the awareness of actually knowing God. If we want God's love, to flow in us and through us. We need to make knowing him the center 
of our ambition and our hope, our time, our will, and our effort. You see, knowing God in a personal way, that his love infiltrates our souls and minds is the differentiating factor for our world. It always has been. It still is. It's knowing God and his love in individual lives that has brought about the great social reforms of the past. It's knowing the love of God and living in it that raised the dignity and honor of women and children in the first century in a male-dominated world. It was this deep love of God in people that caused his followers to develop the earliest forms of like medical treatments and hospitals and taking care of the sick when the popular treatment was to take the dead and dying and throw them into the city landfill site. But this love was so compelling that it changed that social idea of what was normal. It's knowing God and him as love personally that caused Jesus followers to stay behind and help the sick during frequent pandemics while others fled to safety. It was knowing God and being formed by his deep, deep love that created orphanages and hospice care and visitation of people in prison and caring for the least of the least. And it was this kind of love in a time when three out of five citizens in the Roman kingdom were slaves or indentured servants, that Christians who knew this love that they had been freed were the ones that put up their own money to free these people and give them a new life and a new start, but they had been gripped by the love they had experienced. And it was this kind of love that caused people to honor and respect governing authorities in spite of their misgivings and mistrust because they had the greater trust that comes from knowing God and his deep love for them. So what was it that happened in the first century that brought this about? Well, it all began with a single demonstration for them of just how stunning the effect is on the human soul when the human soul grasps the depth of God's love for them. We just read 1 John 4, 8, where John writes, anyone who doesn't know God doesn't love, and that's the deal. The very next sentence, the very next sentence, John writes, where he's telling us that knowing God translates into something for us, but there's an event that happened. And here's what he says in verse 9. He says, God showed how much he loved us. Here's the event. By sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. His love was not something he put on. He couldn't stop himself. And this is what he did because love was who and is who he is. That unthinkable act of love from a perfect heavenly father is the mic drop act of love that when people have personalized it for their lives, it's converted them into love and compelled people who have in turn loved in such a way that their families have seen it in them and their families have been changed and communities have been changed and cities have been changed and social injustice has been taken away and lives that were devalued have been valued. It's the compelling love in the human being that does this, that makes this happen. So like you, I've been thinking a lot over the last couple of weeks about my own view of people and race and governing authorities and what the place, what place the church has in a season just like this in our generation. I've talked to people, I've prayed with people, I've watched what I could. Many of you have suggested books and documentaries I should watch or sermons that I should watch because they've moved you. And many of those I've tried to do is I've had time to do that. I came across this one thing that so struck me and I parked on it and I just want to read it to you. It's from a church historian who lived almost 100 years ago. And he saw his own share of chaos and disappointment in social settings and uh, in his culture of the day. And this is what he writes from his understanding of Christian history. He says this, History shows that the thought of Christ on a cross has been more potent than anything else in arousing a compassion for the suffering and indignation at injustice. It's the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ is God's great demonstration of love to this world. It's this personalized good news that God came into the world he absolutely loved. He came disguised as a human being, knowing what the world needed. We named him Jesus. He lived among us. He lived an exemplary life, but that wasn't only the only reason he came. He came to die. He came to give his life for you and me out of love for us. He went ahead and he did that, but apparently love is even stronger than death and 
God raises his son back to life. And before he departs this world, he says, you know something? I want to live with you. If you'll accept who I am, I want to come live with you, live with you inside of you. And I will take all that is love, all that is me. And I will put that inside of you because I bring that with me because it's not separate from me. This is how I want to transform people. I want to transform cultures and societies. I want to bring dignity to the hurting and the lost. I want to do it through love of people that I put in them because I'm present in them. In 1967, the year that All You Need Is Love was written, it was also what became known as the long hot summer of 1967. It was known for the civil and racial unrest in our country, protests and looting by, uh, by looters in 159 different cities in our, in our country. At that time, there was a well-known Christian leader, evangelist. His name was Billy Graham. Some of you will know that, highly respected uh, within Christian culture for, sh- for sure, but around the world as well. Some of you may be too young to know that name. Check it out. He's a man of great integrity. But 50 years ago, while that was going on in 1967, he had a daily radio broadcast, and uh, this is what he communicated to the nation. Uh, summer of 1967, what was on his heart. And this is what he writes. What are we witnessing today? Many of our Christian organizations are making resolutions and pronouncements. They're lobbying to bring into being and enforce the social changes envisioned by church leaders as part of a world where the church shall be the dominating influence. When most major Protestant denominations have their annual councils, assemblies, conventions, they make pronouncements on matters having to do with disarmament, federal aid to education, birth control, the United Nations, any number of social and political issues. And goes on to say, now I am not finding fault with consideration of such matters. However, the pendulum has swung too far and the emphasis is now being misplaced. Very rarely are resolutions passed that have to do with the redemptive witness of the gospel. We've been trying to solve every ill of society as though society were made up of truly Christian people to whom we have an obligation to speak the Christian advice. We must realize that while the law should guarantee human rights and restrain those who violently violate those rights, whenever people lack sympathy for the law, they will not long respect it, even when they cannot repeal it. Thus, the government may try to legislate Christian behavior, but it soon finds that people remain unchanged. And then he makes this statement, I underlined it. It's, he says, the changing of lives is the primary mission of the church. The only way to change people is to help them become transformed by the love of Christ on the cross. Then, then they will have the capacity to live up to the Christian command to love your neighbors. I don't read that as a commentary on our need for social change in our country. We do. We need new laws. We need new ways to bring our lives together. Change for sure. But it's not the place to start. Jesus knows something about the human heart where he says, if you want to bring social change and reform, if you want to bring dignity to those who are marginalized, it starts in the hearts of people. That's where it starts. We try to do these other things and they're okay. But if that's our starting point, it just doesn't bring lifelong change. You see, here's what, Jesus crucified, resurrected, and living in us teaches. It teaches us that we're all lost, that we all have got it wrong, that we're all at odds with God. But God wasn't okay with that, nor was he going to wipe us out because of it. He comes to us, so different from him, but he comes to us out of love for us. So far that he says, you know, the, the price of love is worth paying. It means death for me, but it's worth it because you're worth it. I can't help myself. So I'm going to come and give my life on a cross for you so we can be reconciled, so we can have a friendship and a relationship. We can be back together the way that it's designed. We can do that. But I won't force myself on you. If this is what you want, if you want a new life, if you want hope, if you'll stop long enough to do a little reflection where this death of my son on the cross is not just a theological idea or a pathway to get to heaven, 
but it's actually a transformative experience where the human becomes spiritually alive. If you want that, then you got to be honest with yourself that you and I are at odds. And the only way back to me is through what happened in that first century on a dreadful night on Friday night in Jerusalem. And if you do, here's what I promise. My resurrection from the death to life means you can move from death to life. That means not only is your eternity in heaven secure, it is, but I want to live with you here and now. I want to come to you. I want to live inside of you. I won't force myself. The metaphor he uses is I knock at the door of your heart. Could I just bust it down? Yeah, but I won't do that. Love does not demand its own way, but love comes and he has come to us. You know, we don't do this a whole lot, but I want to really directly and frankly say, if your relationship with God is one where he's distant, where you just go to him when you need something from him, when you want something from him. If you're banking on the fact that you said a prayer at some point and that's your ticket to heaven and you can live however you want now, you've missed it. You really have. That's not what Jesus came into this world for. He came to stop the self-saving process we were in, to save us at his own cost of his own life and then come live in us. And when he does, he comes and lives with us forever And when he does, because he is love, he comes and lives in us and it shapes and changes our thinking the way we see the world, the way we see each other, the way that we care for those that are weak and poor and marginalized, those that disagree with us. And here's the interesting thing. When we discover him in us and what he does in us, you know what we become? We become a little more patient. We have a humility that takes over. We find it just don't have to have my way all the time. We find that truth matters a great deal and justice is what we pursue because of love for people. I want to ask you today, if you don't know Jesus that way, would you be willing to say, I don't know you that way and come, forgive me, make the effect of the cross take hold in my soul and my life because I want to love like you love me. Invite him to be in, to come and be present with you and watch what he does. I love the way John finishes this letter that he writes uh, where at the, toward the end of chapter four, verse 18 or 19, he says, you know, we love because we were first loved. That's the whole story in one little sentence. I trust you know him, that the love that he has is something that's growing in you. And we shape the world out of hearts that have been loved like we have been loved. Jesus, it starts with you in our hearts and our lives. It really does. And as people are are watching this and thinking about it, I ask you that you would stir deeply in people's hearts who don't know you in that kind of personal way. They just know you as a distant deity and they're maybe even afraid of you. Would you, even in this moment, would you open their eyes to see? Would you call them by their name? Would they hear the knock on the door of their heart? Might they say yes? and discover that this is where change for them happens. Change in their souls and their lives, but change how they see the world and they see people around. And then activate us, Jesus, to be agents of that love in our world. And we would do this for your fame, for your fame, Jesus. Amen.